Okay, so I told you we're going to argue about diarrhea with these products. Okay, so the data is the data. How they collected the data is one thing, but we've all used all these products. Do you have a feeling on the stratification of intensity? So amatiza, uh, the strength of that diarrhea effect versus placanotide versus linaclotide. How would you sort of stack them? Holly, you want to take a shot at that? Um, because look, there are yeah. patients who are yeah. extreme constipation who need the extreme. There are patients who are mild constipation who maybe a milder agent would be the right choice. So we're really putting the patient in the center and saying, okay, which of these three products fits the severity of your case? And, and that's really what the framework of my question is. Can you rank these and then perhaps compartmentalize them to patients? It's hard to rank them based on evidence, but I can tell you based on anecdote. And, and in real life, what happens is that multiple factors are there. Patient symptoms, let's face it, what drugs is covered with what, by what insurance and how much uh, they have to pay. Uh, and uh, also how many times you uh, take that medication and also what is the side effect profile of that drug. So based on that, in my practice, uh, I have to say I go after GCC agonists first. Uh, if patient is on the mild to moderate uh, side in terms of constipation, I'll try placanotide first and then um, uh, linaclotide. Interesting enough, I have seen patients that uh, they don't respond to one GCC agonist, that they respond to the other. And uh, now it's a, a bit uh, confusing how that happens, but again, the, the site of action of these two drugs are different. Uh, Placanotide works mostly on uh, proximal small bowel as opposed to uh, linaclotide that is more distal. And then uh, in my practice, if GCC agonist among uh, secretic drugs are not working, then I switch to uh, amitiza, mostly because um, it's a twice daily medication and also the side effect of nausea that, uh, that can be significant in some of the patients. Oh, yeah. So How that's do do my it? rank. Do you, do you do it that way? Um, it's pretty similar. I, I think what Elise said, it, it kind of varies from patient to patient, and I actually use all three pretty liberally. Um, if they have more pain, I, I'll choose one of the GCCs. If it's constipation and more milder, I will do uh, lubiprostone. Uh, the you know I like linaclotide and I like lubiprostone because they're they're different doses. We talked about eight and twenty four for lubiprostone, but in fact, there's no reason you can't do sixteen, which is how I have patients take it. I you know start once, and they'll do twice, three, and they can find that right dose. And the same thing with linaclotide. Placanotide don't have that kind of leeway, uh, but I but I use all three, and I think. Uh, for efficacy of linaclotide and placanotide, I think they're pretty similar. I'm not sure about the side effects. I, I occasionally see diarrhea, which, which oftentimes isn't a big problem for patients uh, and with both products. Okay. A new product that just came on the market really for chronic constipation, so not really IBS-C. I guess that's why we sort of skimmed over it, but perhaps there is a crossover benefit and that is brucalopride. So um, why don't you take that one, Tony? So, so brucalopride uh, was approved, approved by the FDA in December of 2018, but in fact it's been out in Europe for probably a decade or so. Uh, the initial studies were done here over you know, 15, 20, 15 plus years ago. Um, it seems to be effective for chronic idiopathic constipation. It's not been studied in IBS with constipation, uh, to be, just to be clear. But there are lots of studies uh, that have been done uh, mainly in Europe now showing that, it, that it's effective and it appears to be safe with a uh, devoid of any cardiovascular side effects because there was another product called Tegasrod which was like Prucalopride, but Prucalopride's a full 5-HT4 agonist and Tegasrod's a partial agonist. There was some question of whether there was cardiovascular concerns with Tegasrod, uh, which we don't think have really panned which out. Which is also back now. Which also got approved, yeah. exactly. Um, I've not been able to get it at the pharmacy yet. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's out yet, but uh, Brucalopride is. So we now have two 5-HT4 agonists. Now, Tegasrod was studied in IBS with uh, constipation, was shown to be effective, and we were using it quite extensively uh, before it was removed from the market. So we're f and, and I think with Brucalopride, there's, you know, uh, that, that there's probably some re uh, good reason to use it. Again, we don't know the effect on abdominal pain, but I suspect it'll probably be effective. Yeah, there might be limitations on who to use Tegasrod in because of some of the narrow uh, um, 
discussions with the FDA. We have to see what that all looks like. Well, well actually, the, the, the indication is um, women with IBSC under the age of 65, so it's just important for people to realize that is the FDA-approved uh, indication. And, you know, one other thing just to know about Tegasarod, which is interesting, is it's the only drug that we've talked about that actually has an RCT and IBS-M, IBS with a mixed bowel pattern. Uh, and 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 did did show benefits. Um, so, yeah, you're right. We'll we'll see how this sorts out in the in the marketplace. But um, uh, there there are no studies with percalipride and IVSC yeah. at the current time. I do think this is an important advance for the toolbox oh, for yeah. those of us that are managing these patients. Um, it does seem like percalipride works across the GI tract, including in the foregut and. We haven't talked a lot about this, but we've been focused on IBS, but we know there's overlap with other conditions, particularly dyspepsia, uh, functional dyspepsia, GERD to some degree overlaps with IBS. And you know, I'm not saying 5-HT4 um, agonists necessarily cure those conditions, but they, there is evidence uh, that Tegasarod, for example, can to some degree reduce the symptoms, the foregut symptoms of dyspepsia. So for me, when I think of a patient as, yeah, lower GI symptoms, but also foregut symptoms, I start thinking that maybe these 5-HT4, particularly the highly selective 5-HT4 agonists are, are yeah. useful. Prokinetics, so they're so, back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yep. Yeah. Uh, the point that um, Bill mentioned is very important. We were talking about IBS diarrhea and IBS-C, and IBS-M, sometimes I feel like it's left out. There are very, very few studies on IBS, and well, Tegasarod being one, target one and target two on rifaximin also included IBS and patients and some data on uh, with peppermint, and that's essentially it. Uh, so uh, that's another group that we need to pay attention to. Yeah. This is why I have a deep bench, because <laughs> remind me of this, this category of drugs that just yeah. recently came out, yeah. so thank yeah. you for that.